This is the Andres Segovia Show. Welcome to the Andres Segovia Show. I am Andres. I'm a first-generation American, born and raised in Los Angeles, and I am an admirer of, of what you do and those like you uh, do. So my screen just went blank here on my other tablet, so I have some uh, guides for uh, to make sure I, I hit all the thoughts I like to approach. But uh, you, as we talked about just before we got rolling, so to speak, um, you're you're well known mostly now basically for outing yourself uh to in a way set the record straight uh with a couple of other your colleagues um i know them best as their nicknames uh tanto and take to set the record straight about what what went down um in benghazi libya and as i told you that's been spoken ad nauseum so anybody that's interested in checking that stuff out uh, i already spoken about this in the pre-recorded intro but just in case the book 13 hours by um, Mitchell Zuckoff or the film of Michael Bay, people can look into that. But with respects to exactly who you are and your band of brothers there, um, for the audience has never heard of GRS, can you explain to them what exactly that is? Yeah. Um, so in the private security world or private security contractor world, you have basically two different types of contractors. You have those that are industrial contractors so a lot of people have heard about them. There are those that work for companies like Blackwater or Hart or Dynacor, um, things like that, or companies like that. They're contracting, they're subcontractors to that company, which has the contract. And then there are um, the, uh, pri- the direct hires is what we call them. And that means that I was, di- I was a contractor as a direct hire with the uh, Central Intelligence Agency. Um, I'll, I also like to call it the Culinary Institute of America, um, but <laughs> it is uh, we're direct hires to them, and I'm a contractor directly with the U.S. government, and we work for a group called GRS, which is Global Response Staff, and our job is to be bodyguards for our country's spies, basically. Now, is I don't know if you're uh, able to answer this question, but why would the government higher private security for basically publicly funded uh, security uh, agencies of the government? Don't we have plenty of armed forces? Why would they hire someone in private? I don't know if you know that answer or you've been asked that, but I am curious why. Um, The biggest reason is all of us have, um, you know, extensive military background and for being a private contractor, private security contractor, one, um, I think a lot of it has to do with uh, ease of deploying us to wherever they need us. Uh, as a contractor that's a direct hire, I can go anywhere that they want me to in the world. If I'm using an industrial contractor, they have to have a contract with that area mm-hmm. that they're going to be working in. Um, if it's military, it's a completely separate branch of um, service because that's Department of Defense which has its own chain of command where when you're with uh, either state department or any of those groups, then um, it's going to be that you have some, that you're working directly for them and it's a whole different pay scale, pays all of those different things. Mm, Okay. And I guess in summary from, from the political standpoint is that it cuts to a lot of red tape. It sounds. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Okay. So that's uh as someone that is a small business owner um i know what it means to have insurance to uh, operate as an independent contractor which is something that i have heard you touch on 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 one of the one of your interviews or it might have been a documentary even um for example you're in california which is pretty much if you're a small business owner uh, you're working mostly to pay insurances off uh, we got general liability insurance we have to have workman's compensation insurance um there we have a bond on top of that too and sometimes you need a bond for a bond uh, and if that's not enough there are particularly that's not even counting the automotive insurance that is needed for a lo- for those of us to have vehicles and we have equipment and so on and so forth in other words a lot of insurance All i right. imagine as independent contractors you guys need to have your own uh, insurance of sorts uh can you speak to uh, to that what insurances are um, basically required if you if you can um, or if you have a pre-existing life insurance policy, you can have that um, your, or a pre-existing health insurance that will cover you when that type of job description, which most of them don't, 
Mm -hmm. Um, And because of that, the federal government has years ago, back in, I think, World War II established, it's called the Defense Base Act, or it's a law that was um, requires that private security or private contractors that work for the U.S. government has have to have a workman's cop policy at a minimum. And that's pretty much what most of us have. And that's it is a workman's mm. cop policy. You know, as someone that actually has to renew a, a workman's comp every single year, we have a lot of competition for our workman's compensation insurance. I imagine there aren't that many options for what you do. I uh, know it has to be gone. I mean, because the, uh, what we do is also, um, classified Hmm. and there's only one group usually that has that uh, contract to provide that um so you have to go through the one that they tell you you go through wow that sounds like a monopoly and they control the prices oh man yeah it's 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 very interesting (laughs) because i mean not only do you have your workman's comp policy and now the benefit for us is it is we have to pay it up front but then mm. do in our contract, the government reimburses us for that workman's comp. Okay. Um, but then also with that is underneath that, there's a, what they call a war hazards clause. So if there's any of your injuries are obtained in a act of war or anything that would replicate an act of war, the federal government pays back the insurance company 115% of all the money that they spend on taking care of you or fixing you up or um, all of that. So it's kind of like they get to double dip. Yeah, that's that's really what it sounds like. It almost sounds like they would interest them uh, for you to be in those situations. Huh. Uh, yeah, because, you know, it's um, it's interesting because like all of my injuries, and I don't know, I've I've heard this only. Um, so I don't know for a fact if this is um, completely factual, but my understanding is that you know, insurance companies are good at projecting costs that they're mm-hmm. going to spend to take care of somebody based on injuries and life expectancy and things like that. So they, my understanding is that they bill the federal government up front after they determine what your injuries are for all of that. And they come up with that number that, you know, Mark Geist got injured at the age of 40. He's going to live to be 75 or 76 is the average uh, life expectancy. Um, We will pay him roughly $5,100 a month for the next every, you know, it's basically $60,000 a year from the age of 40 to the age of 76. Mm. So they come up with that number. They give that back. They bill that to the federal government, and then they get their 15% tacked on top of that. And it just seems like it's a big money making uh, money. I mean, it is what it is. And I mean, I go into it knowing that, mm-hmm. or at least most of the guys do uh, to some degree. But um, I just think it's uh, there's better ways to do it, I think. Yeah. Um, and that's. Uh, and that touches on a lot. I've actually dealt with government contracts as well. And there's, you can pad these things a lot. And that explains why even in Congress, pork barrel, um, just a, a lot of pork that's added onto these bills. We go, oh, yeah. Oh, well, yeah, you can. Um, it's I'm not, not a subject I'm going to get into this, uh, into this conversation, but uh, what California is doing right now in terms of trying to alleviate housing because they want to address homelessness. Uh, it's, the gross mismanagement talking about a surplus while they're saying that we have record debt that doesn't make any sense that doesn't mean we have a surplus but they're looking instead of paying down debts they're looking for new ways to spend it and they're they keep (laughs) trying things that don't work uh in the name of helping those they've been trying to help the programs have only exacerbated the problems i'm actually going to talk about that in the in an upcoming episode for uh, for that very thing particularly because it's it it's in the area of what i do no, there's a reason I'm I'm going down this kind of line of of making people understand of uh, this this GRS world and uh, where you come from uh, because I, I don't know if I mentioned it while, while we were now recording but um, basically the the Benghazi terrorist attack is something that it exposed or at least brought to uh, awareness to uh, to GRS. Uh, I first started learning about them 
uh, around uh, when Black Rifle, Black Rifle Coffee started taking off. Um, I really respect those guys, despite some of the political uh, uh, fires that have been happening uh, recently. There's <laughs> outrage culture everywhere. I'm not, yeah. I'm not addressing that. But um, listening to Matt Best tell his, his side of the story, every time he came back from a tour, uh, he, he basically couldn't assimilate uh, to civilian life, and he just wanted to go back out there. And even uh, you, you, you know, your, your colleague, uh, uh, Tonto, just hearing him talk, um, even reminiscing, every time he's, they bring this up, he's like, I want to go back out there. It's like, oh, and on, on Instagram, it looks like he's getting ready to go back out there. Like, he's, <laughs> he is keeping in shape. So it's like, oh, this dude is serious. Um, with uh, respects to um, people like that, uh, that serve and, and don't stop serving, uh, I believe there there is a point where it's like, uh, okay, you maxed out here. You, you can't serve any more tours. Either choose to be a career um, military guy going up the ranks of general, whatever, or contracting. Um, normally, when people think about this, they probably think, oh, mercenary, or guns for hire. And I think that's a, uh, uh, I think that's too um, broad. I would reserve that for more of the guerrilla warfare in my. Hispanic country south of the border, yeah. but but with respects to what, why would I guess this is a little more personal? Why did you get into contracting? Um, you know, I spent twelve years in the Marine Corps. I got out. I was in law enforcement for about a little bit over six years. Uh, worked crimes against children as a deputy for a local county sheriff, and then I was chief of police in a small town. And I just when we got when the war kicked off, it was just a way to get back into it, serving my country and serving the people of this country. Um, and that was the easiest route to do it and get one is the best gain for me or the best use of my skills. And it also afforded me a better way to, to, to make a decent living. Um, now the downside, you know, is going into the contracting world is you don't have, you know, you got to provide everything. You don't have this family support services. You don't have, you know, the insurance, any of that stuff. And and you go into it understanding that, um, you know, and, and like you said, I mean, the difference between contractors and mercenaries is contractors are, are doing jobs where it's not offensive action. Hmm. There is at no time did we go out seeking to go, you know, doing like a direct action mission or going in, doing something where we're going to go, um, which would be offensive or doing a infantry or special forces kind of action. Uh, what we did was protect people. That was our job was to provide protection for others. And if they got shot at, then we had the right to defend ourselves and defend them. Mm -hmm. But never at any time did we want to, I mean, and we worked in small groups. So at no time do you ever want to get into a gunfight anyways. I mean, our idea, my, my idea of security is, not being seen, not being heard, and staying below the radar. Yeah, yeah, that's a great point. Uh, seriously, I, I'm honored that there are people like you out there, because uh, uh, God knows we need more. So it's in the case of uh, as I brought up Matt Best from Black Rifle Coffee. Uh, to him, he he could not assimilate, and uh, his drive was to. Uh, feel that adrenaline rush, I guess you would. Uh, I, I guess uh, those that have served would know what, I'm, what, what that, that means. So he kept going to contract. I don't know how many uh, contracts he ended up doing, but then when he came back and was basically forced uh, into civilian life, so to speak, that's how Black of Coffee really uh, came about with him and his partner, Evan. So um, that that worked out uh, fantastic because then um, their mission to employ 10,000 veterans, so, well, more power to them. I'm excited for yeah. that. Um, but that's just it, that uh, after the uh, the first Persian Gulf War, uh, PTSD became something that uh, people were more aware of. Uh, people didn't really <clears> understand <throat> that. And now uh, it, that's even something that's in the, in the NFL to some extent with the concussions. So that's oh, like you knew about it, but didn't do something about it. So now uh, what now to those that suffered from it or suffer uh, different things? Uh, it, it, there's, a, there's a lot that isn't really being addressed and people just want to either throw more money at it uh, with uh, services that don't address um, the root cause. Instead, they're just trying to treat the symptoms, um, for which is why it's, uh, I don't think that problem's going to get solved just like that because they're not getting to the, to the heart of the issue, um, which is something that I guess we'll get into in a bit. You had mentioned 
uh, something with respect to injuries. And this kind of goes along why I was building up to this because I didn't catch it the first time. Um, I, there's some captions at the end of the, the film 15 hours. I'm like, wait a minute, did I read that right? So I'm going to touch on that. But I have a, a very close family friend try, just trying to get um, his, the mail out of his mailbox at the front of his house. And he lives by himself. And as he was going over to get it, uh, there was a planter that was uh, basically, uh, he, had, he had had that uprooted. So now it was basically a ditch. And I don't know how th- this might have happened, but unfortunately, he tripped and fell and landed on both of his forearms, basically breaking. So he could not reach out for help. All he could do be there screaming by himself. So the the process that it has been for him to even get back to get some functions of his hand has been quite a journey uh, t- uh, to just even be able to write his name. Because so, he loves writing checks. Uh, he's one of those old school types. So um, that was quite something uh, to... to to, to basically see and involve him because he and my father are very close friends that um, my father was with him um, for a lot of that uh, recovery journey. Some might not be aware of your injury. Uh, can, can you let my audience know of, of what injury you sustained um, during um, that infamous day? Well, the, the, the most visible one was um, my, and I, I start this off with the fact that I was left-handed, um, but, my left arm uh, piece of shrapnel went through it, disintegrated two inches of the radial bone, two inches of the median nerve, uh, shattered the ulna, and basically a piece of skin here and a piece of skin and, and a little bit of meat down here was all that was holding it on. Wow. Uh, it was pretty much, if you've seen them, anybody out there of your viewers who have seen the movie, um, they did a great job of making it uh, look real. Yeah. Uh, in, in the movie. But, um, so that was my major, that was probably the major injury that was visible, but, uh, the only other one, the other one they showed kind of in the movie was, um, I had a, got lacerated on my neck, mm. I had some shrapnel get my neck. And it was, um, as my wife says, because when my wife uh, first saw me or when I first talked to her, she asked if I was okay. And I says, yeah, I broke my arm and I got a few scratches. Mm. Um, and, uh, when she saw me in the hospital, she's like, well, your arm, your arm seems to be okay, but it looks like they about took your head off too. Oh man! But, um, and, but totally, I had another roughly about 20 to 25 holes in me from shrapnel, um, four or five pieces in the chest up and down both arms and legs, uh, um, along here in my eyes. The only thing that saved my sight probably was I had night vision goggles on. So, mm. um, you know, the movie did a good job depicting the major ones, but there was a bunch of other minor ones too that came along with that. Yeah. And and that tends to uh, be what there's only so much that can be said or shown or even understood uh, in a film. That's why I can't tell you how many times I've seen that movie. And every time I pick up a different nuance, which is to tells me that uh, Michael Bay really did his job in research. Um, I don't know if you were among those that were brought onto the set before they started filming when they recreated the compound. Uh, I know, I know Tonto was there, uh, but uh, I'm like, whoa, this is like pretty legit. Um, I actually showed some pictures of the, of, of both the set and the actual attack and i showed my wife and friends like tell me which one is the film and which one is the is the real thing and i'm like whoa that, i know that was attention to detail considering how quickly the director moved but i don't want i don't want entirely want to get statue with the film because i could i'm a big film junkie and um this is probably my favorite military movie of all but with, with respect to that the, the reason it's important is because at the end of the film it talks about you being re-enlisted uh, to be treated for your wounds because yes. again as someone as a small business owner uh, there's been accidents even uh, um, during the course of, of of work it's construction so uh, it happens um these things are very very expensive and in some cases or well, not some but most cases workman's comp is there to try to find out how not to pay for the injuries <laughs> and in in your situation um knowing what happened to 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 my to my friend that i consider an uncle and how how hard it was for him to come back from that and he hasn't entirely fully come back from that uh i, I can't imagine how expensive that must have been and you just talked about how many more holes you said you uh, you got in yeah uh, we're talking about this was the was it the small rockets fire which i'm assuming was an rpg or was it the motor or 
or a combination um, of both? Main, mainly the mortars. The, uh, the RPG hit the wall out in front of us. Um, luckily, the bad guys weren't very good shooters, and most of the rounds hit um, either went past us or below us. But what really got me was the mortars, and it's there was three of them that landed on the rooftop, and they were 81 millimeter mortars. And and this gives you an idea of wow. so an 81 millimeter mortar has is about three and a half inches um, in diameter and has a kill radius of 132 feet, which means that if you're within 132 feet, you have about a 98, 99% chance of dying. Um, and this, I mean, I, this is where I know that, you know, the Lord, the Lord was watching over me, had his protection on me that night because I was within 15 to 17 feet of three of them. So I, sh- there, there's really no reason I should have lived. I mean, I should have died three times that night on the rooftop alone. And, uh, and for whatever reason, the blast went through me and actually killed Ty, who was standing on the opposite side of me. Um, you know, and and for why that happened, I have no answer other than it's God's purpose. Uh, and uh, and who am I to question Him? Yeah. And as a fellow brother in Christ, I can tell you that uh, this is that purpose. You're. You started something here, uh, the Shadow Warriors Project, that brings attention to all this. Um, I've taken uh, time to address what basically no one's talked about. They only like to talk about the event itself and the politics thereof and and this and that. That's not what interests me. It's what interests me is that uh, this just highlights things that uh, there are those that do this and nobody knows about them. Um, And they're really isn't much available to them in terms of, of recourse or resources, or even benefits, uh, so to speak, to to tend to them, especially when all the attention, and I'm not saying it's a bad thing, but um, a lot of attention when we do speak of our veterans, we think mostly of those that uh, uh, served uh, publicly, if you will, um, and a lot of the charities and organizations are meant for that. And now, I guess I got to give a trigger warning for some people here. I did not know this. This is actually something I saw last night. Um, uh, Donald Trump Jr. was actually uh, uh, bringing awareness to also bring up uh, some, some kind of fundraiser for uh, the organization as well. Uh, you mentioned that, that you both are friends, which uh, I think is pretty awesome. I imagine that was because you guys met on the campaign trail, but I, it's not something I want to I dive into. But I, I am bringing it up because um, there's more big voices need to lend more to this. Uh, yeah. compared to him I'm a, I'm a small fry but uh, for those that that know me uh, i will not stop talking about uh, your organization i heard when it's brought up like yeah finally somebody so there is your answer for why you walked out of there um mm-hmm. that you're the first um and we are gonna i don't know how much time i have with you but i, I do want to get to what the shadow wars is now doing and the canine project and all that um but with it, it's the serious injury um I'm assuming that's why you were re-enlisted, so to speak, so they can uh, try to cover the expenses uh, thereof. Um, yes. And the other part of it was because, um, unfortunately, it got turned into a political football that was getting tossed back and forth. And the amount of publicity that it was getting, because um, what they did is the easiest way to explain it to people on the movie where they would understand it is that I got re-enlisted. What really was is I had direct, I had the the uh, um, Department of Defense, the director of the Department of Defense gave me authorization to utilize military facilities to get my life-saving injuries, which are my major injuries taken care of. Um, and that was, you know, because they had the expertise at Walter Reed to take care of my arm and some of my other injuries where a civilian hospital, as good as they are, they don't have as much experience in blast injuries as they did Mm -hmm. in Walter Reed. Um, The number one hand surgeon in the army was the guy that treated me. And, uh, and that's, he was phenomenal. Um, But that's, that's kind of what explained, that was just the easier way of explaining what the uh, DOD directive was that allowed me to have access to, to what my uh to the military care system at least for that purpose yeah and that that's why like when i saw that uh recently like, about a week ago since we're recording this i'm like hold on i need to know what that means it's because <laughs> for so i've been in the political arena of ideas for about 18 years 
um, and before the politics, uh, I, I was involved in a lot of uh, doctrine and the, uh, theological debates. I born and raised a, a Christian, didn't make me a Christian, uh, but uh, when I accepted Christ as my personal savior, um, I, I still wasn't entirely sure what I was doing. I got baptized at 16, but I say I, don't, I didn't start living for him until I was perhaps almost 18. Um, and, and that's someone coming from uh, dealing with uh, uh, a lot of depression. Uh, uh, I'm a suicide survivor. I spent that five times. And I'm like, God, why won't you let me die? Satan won't let me live. So uh, all that is to say that uh, he said he has a purpose for me. And uh, and like, I'll go with it. Uh, I don't want to live, but uh, you're saying there's a purpose for me. Fine, I'll yield over to you. And so I guess there's a reason for it. I mean, I didn't ask to be born, but all right, I'm here now. So um, that that's uh, that's kind of where, where um, I was uh, brought up. I'm not even entirely sure where I went on that segue, but uh, <laughs> there it is. So uh, I never, I actually never talked about this on my show. So um, here I am opening up a little more, I, I guess, because this is, I guess you could say this has been entirely personal to me in a way, um, both 9-11 attacks. This is the one that really is, is washed under because of, they say, most people still think it's a YouTube video. Ridiculous. Um, and I think that's why I take it personally. It's like, no, uh, and it's because of that, that people like you are not taken as seriously. And like, no, we, they need to, to be taken seriously. Uh, I mean, I was saving this question for the end, but I think the, the, the way we're building up to this, I think it segues nicely. People don't understand uh, individuals like yourself mm-hmm. that put others above themselves. And you were not uh, at, the, at the annex when uh, this stuff started going down. Um, I, I, the film tells it in one way, but the point is you were off site. Yep. But I imagine had you been on site, you would have left with your brothers to, uh, to the villa. Oh yeah. Yeah. If I, if I had been out in town by myself without a female, without the female case officer, I mean, my job is to make sure she survives and get her back to safety. And I've been out there by myself. I'd have just went straight over to, uh, to take care of what needed to be taken care of over at the consulate. Um, you know, and that's, it's really what it is about a lot of us that are in the military. Um, it's serving that something bigger in ourselves. And, and, you know, and I get into debates with people a lot about um, personal service or selfishness versus selfless service. Mm. And that selfless service is, you know, our service is to the constitution. And that constitution allows people to disagree with me. And I support that constitution that allows us to have a difference of opinion, to have all those rights. Even if I disagree with somebody, um, I'm willing to sacrifice and die for that, for them to have the same rights as me um, and every other American out there. And that's, I think that's sometimes where it's lost and why a lot of people you know, get offended that are in the military because people don't understand why they serve. And that service is something bigger than ourselves. It's, and it, it's to the people of this country to make sure that we, we have the freedoms that we have and, you know, being Memorial Day and all of that. I mean, it's, it's all of those who have died that have gone before us to make sure that exists. Yeah. And it's sad how, um, um, a lot of people don't even know why there's a Memorial Day. Um, I actually pre-recorded the intro to this. Uh, to, where it was getting close to press time, as they say. And it's like, you know what? Uh, we, we pushed the, the schedule around a, a little bit, but I'm still going to pre-shoot. Uh, I shot it like almost two weeks ago. Uh, the intro and I talk about how I think it was a PragerU video that I saw. A man on the street uh, interviews. Why do we have a Memorial Day? Why do we have a Memorial Day? And a lot of people think it's kind of like July 4th. Oh, you know, it's just, a, a, I guess, something to do with um independence day like just got nothing to do with it uh and it's like wow really uh if anything i guess you could say there's two days set aside uh, to remember our veterans uh one because armistice day they will never be another great war again 20 years later and it's like oh yeah that didn't last long uh, yeah it, it's called human nature <laughs> where it's, uh, we're d- designed to just be at each other's throats um so uh turning into veterans day like uh, uh, for my before I became like a video platform, I was doing podcasts. I, w- I would do a, a ceremonial thing where like, hey, thank a vet. Um, but um, lately, at these past couple of years, like, you know what? We need more to remember the fallen to. And not enough is being done for that. Uh, and like I had said at the onset, there is this theme of forgotten 
that uh, is uh it's very well driven in the film like to really hit hard uh and the soundtrack by Lauren Balfe is just absolutely amazing um particularly because uh, the uncut song is about nine and a half minutes long and he took a lot of uh and this is me getting into the compositional stuff um he took a lot of cues from from his teacher Hans Zimmer uh who did a thin red line also a great soundtrack um and called Journey to the Line so it builds it crescendos into this emotional um like impact and in the film when i because uh, i heard the soundtrack before the film i was actually one of those that was turned off by the reviews that's why i didn't see the film and that's how political that whole thing became it's like oh michael bay did a movie so you know it's not a good movie you don't have to go see that it's not a good movie and like and i bought into that until co-workers of mine told me that they couldn't stop crying it's like okay what's going on here uh crying like uh bruce willis done at the end of armageddon kind of crying what are we talking about because of michael bay film um so but i had heard the soundtrack so here in the context of it and they did in the scene uh, that they used the the music is the moment where the uh, the cia uh, um, worker with the gal she's making phone calls to try to get some kind of help uh to uh to the annex like look under attack we're alone here at least just send some jets and the shot is in silence the jets are on the tarmac they're not going anywhere it's that theme of forgotten that uh, continues to be like something that 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 sh- like it, it's kind of like a, a dark cloud over all this, and it's almost like politically people want this to be swept away because if they bring attention to your organization, they have to bring attention to the incident that in of it itself is a political football. It's like why can't we just see what happened and we the politics be damned? There are Americans that needed help. We didn't help them, and if it wasn't for six guys on the ground that literally <laughs> were protecting and serving people that they don't know for the most part it's 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 amazing and and that i guess that kind of leads to, to, the, to this question because I, I built it up had you been uh, had you been at the annex when it all went down you would have gone you're in enemy territory mm-hmm. you can't tell friend from foe and like you say you're trying to keep a low profile what the heck would drive somebody to go through all that hostile terrain to get to a place that you don't know how many people are there. You can hear the motor, probably the, the rocket propeller grenades, the small arms fire at this place. You can hear the screams over the radio. Why would you undermanned try to go there to tr- save people you don't know? What, what kind of mindset is that? You know, it's, uh, it's, it's, that selfless service, it's being a part of something bigger than, I mean, it's making a difference in somebody else's life. Um, I mean, in a, in a kind of another way of looking at it, it's like seeing somebody who falls down or is in a car wreck and driving by or that person that stops, which mm-hmm. one do you want to be? You know, I've got, I'm in a hurry to get to work or do I want to stop and help this person? Mm. And I'm just that kind of person that would stop and help. Um, It's because I just, it's, I don't know. It's, it's just what's been ingrained in me from, from childhood. Uh, You know, I grew up, my hero was my grandfather. He served in world war two. He was a tank commander. He was in North Africa. He was in um, the push across Germany, had five purple hearts, a silver star, a bronze star. I mean, I had three uncles that served in the military. So that sense of being a part of something bigger than yourself and, and actually making a difference in other people's lives um, for whatever reason, just resonates with who I am. I'm, if you look at everything I've done, I got out, I became a, you know, a law enforcement officer because I got to serve other people. I work crimes against children because I wanted to serve those that couldn't protect themselves. Um, and I went back into contracting because I wanted to help those who couldn't help themselves or at least make the, make it easier for them to help themselves. And, uh, and, and to put a, to put a moniker or a name on, I don't know what it is. It's just who I am. And that's really awesome. Um, because it's, that's the thing you get to think about. You just do. Yeah. And <clears throat> I, the, it, it touch on the movie a little bit again because probably the only way people are ever going to really find out more about it pick up a book people read books it's more detailed you, there's always so much you could put into a movie but <clears throat> you use the analogy of a car wreck 
and you're pulling over to help somebody because within your nature. I guess the difference in the situation that happened of September 11, 2012 was if you pull over and help that person that got uh, that is in that car wreck, you will be fine probably, but mostly you'll be fired from your job and that business will make sure to tell everyone within that industry that you are not allowed to work in that industry ever again. That's something that's really uh, it, 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 it is mentioned in passing in, in the film. Uh, John Krasinski's, uh, uh, it's, it's between uh, Jan, uh, James Bashdell and, and John Krasinski's interchanging the, the dialogue, say goodbye to contracting work, but you can't put a price with living with yourself. That's something that's missed entirely here in right. that it's not just helping somebody that was in a car wreck. You're literally giving everything to go help them. And that's something that you, you and your brothers were not thinking of. It's like, we got to help them. Let's go. And, and, and that's exactly it. I mean, they, we knew that they were um, always undermanned over there. We knew that their level of experience was not as, as great as ours as a team, their team versus ours. I mean, together, if you put the six of us and all of our service to the country together, it's over a hundred years of service. Wow. Um, where you put, those guys at the State Department security team, um, total service would probably less than 30 years, you know. And most of ours was, of our guys, it was all on the higher end of the special ops community. Um, it was a lot of combat related type of experience. And, and that made, and I think part of that made the difference is, you know, it's, we knew that they, would have difficulties and defending themselves. And when they came over, their team leader came over the radio and he said, if you don't get here now, we're going to all die. And there was a few expletives in there as well, but you could, you know, when I'm driving back with the female case officer, I had my radio on, I could hear it as well. And I heard that and you could hear the fear in their voice and you could hear the fact that they were going to, I mean, there was, they would most likely die had we not gone over there. And um, our guys were willing to go over there in spite of that. And, and I don't know how you could, how anybody could be any different than, you know, um, somebody's hanging off a cliff and you stand back because you're afraid of heights or you reach down and grab them and save them. Yeah. Um, it's just, uh, I don't think there's any way other to live life other than, to be a part of something bigger. And I think that's part of that's my Christian heritage and uh, the foundation that I have in that as well. I mean, somebody asked me early on was, uh, were you afraid of dying? And I'm like, why would I be afraid of dying? And they're like, well, you'd be dead. And I'm like, one of two things was going to happen that night. I was either going to live and come home and be with my family, which is phenomenal. Or I was going to die and go home and be with the Lord, which mm. is phenomenal. So tell me where the downside is to any of it. Yeah. Um, you know, and that's that's just the way I approach that kind of thing. That that's where I approach life is um I would rather make a difference in people's lives than not. Yeah, uh, it's Tonto that uh, Chris um he's the the one that has on uh, I saw in a news clipping once um uh, the the main hallway entering his house he has the the verse greater love has no man than this to to lay his life down for another. Um so I yeah, coming from him, it means it means a lot because he was talking about his brothers that laid down their lives. So it's, uh, yeah, it's it, we we do need more more of that. And it's uh, along those lines, having said all this, for why uh, your purpose, uh, as I see, because you're doing God's work, has been creating uh, the Shadow Warriors project uh, with your wife Crystal, right? You you, you both uh, did this, and it's to to honor. Um, it, those that uh, um, that served like you, because uh, to to remove this uh, this like I I brought up mercenaries because people think guns for hire are adrenaline and junkies and all that. Like, no, that's that's not what these guys are. Don't paint them with a a, a broad brush. That's uh, that's a, it's it's prejudice really when uh, we look at it that way. So uh, that's why I wanted to take the time for you to basically dive into that and explain yeah. your mindset because then that 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 really drives home the purpose behind shadow warriors project to help those 
uh, that uh, served and suffered uh, like you did, uh, and and those that continue in silence. Mm -hmm. So, um, I, I, can you can you tell us uh, one of the big things that's been going on was the last year you guys got the K nine project. Uh, so, but now that's like really expanding. Uh, can you can you touch on that uh, for those that uh, are not aware? Yeah. So uh, you know, I was blessed with a group that gave me a service dog. It's a Belgian Malinois. Um, and where they come from is a group, as a breeding group uh, up in Canada called Baden Canine, B-A-D-E-N. It's Baden Canine. They, they've been breeding and raising uh, the shepherd breeds, which are German shepherds, Dutch shepherds, and German sh uh, shepherds for 50 years now, um, roughly. And um, I was, since I was blessed with receiving my dog and, and the difference that it made in my life uh, in a lot of aspects that I never, it took me a while to realize um, I wanted to share that. Me and my wife wanted to be able to share that with other contractors, uh, private security contractors and other veterans uh, because there's a special connection that we have with, with dogs, especially dogs. I mean, animals in general, but you know, I, most people don't think of it like this, but Dogs are the only animal that will leave their own kind to come be with us. There is a special connection that we have with dogs. I think that um, me personally, I think that their dogs were put on this earth by the Lord, by God to be our companions. Um, I don't believe that they're descendants of the wolf. And I know that goes against science, but um, you know, it's uh, tell me a wolf that will leave its own kind to come be with us. They don't. And uh, there's a there's a certain I call it a vibration that we share with this animal uh, and and they help us heal emotionally physically mm -hmm. there's a lot of things that they provide as a service dog as a as, as a canine service dog and so we wanted to share that with with other veterans since uh, it, we were blessed with that and and from that we you know we can only breed enough dogs especially the high end dogs like this that uh, Roan is. Um, and we can only do, you know, give away maybe 10, 15 dogs a year at best. Mm -hmm. um, so we decided to expand it one step further is, you know, I grew up farming and ranching and around animals and horses. I've uh, since I've gotten injured and, you know, I've, I've been aware of a lot of equine therapy programs um, where they're pairing PSD uh, individuals that have PST to or PTS, I mean that have PTS with uh, equines, with horses. Mm. Well, we decided to do the same thing with uh, canines, and we call it a canine therapy program where we bring in 10 combat vets, um, anywhere between 8 to 10. We introduce them to the Lord. Um, we don't prostatize. I'm, I'm not going to force you to do whatever. I think we're going to plant the seed and love on you yeah. and let the Lord work it, do his work. But introduce you to the Lord, introduce you to the dog, and through the dogs, through these canines, teach you how to manage your anxiety and your stress because those dogs are great at helping us with that. And then the third, the third uh, leg in the tripod is to, uh, to get everyone to tell their story. I mean, all of mm -hmm. us, not just your combat story, but your life story, because so many of us that join the military, a lot of times we're either running from something or to something or a combination mm -hmm. of the two. And we show up in the military with a bucket already half full of trauma because you know, we had, we we're single parents or we, you know, had no parents or we were abused physically, sexually, emotionally, whatever the case may be. And if you don't empty that bucket, sometimes it gets full. And if it does, that's when it comes out and affects us and, uh, and those that we love so much. And so we really try to do that peer to peer support and peer to peer counseling by bringing guys and gals together that have served in combat that can understand one another and, and do it in a small enough group where they're it's intimate enough where they're not afraid to share, mm -hmm. but it's, and it's, but it's not so, so, so small that um, it's too intimate. And, uh, and we've just seen great things come of it. Um, and it's just phenomenal because this way we can run one of these at least once a month. And that's over a hundred people that we can do uh, that we can help every year. And, and, and it's the follow on work that comes with it because these small groups end up sticking together and communicating and staying in touch with each other as things grow and as their 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 walk grows both within the group with the dogs and with the lord and it's a, it's phenomenal what we see from it 
Yeah, and that's why uh, I I hold on to the belief that there is such thing as a doggy heaven because I'm looking forward to seeing my dog again. <laughs> it's just, it's like, if not, that's like the only thing that could challenge my faith in God. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, I, I unfortunately um, uh, had a part ways with my dog. Um, uh, lived uh, quite a long time, but uh, it wasn't his time just yet. It was just an unfortunate accident when uh, uh, a friend with a vehicle was uh, came near my dog. So we had to make a decision and everybody turned to me and says, hey, um, so we're going to leave the choice up to you. It's like, I held that puppy when the mom pushed it out. I, that was hard. Um, and, I, and I buried him. I was like, no, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to bury him in my house. And uh, my brother felt for me. It's like, Hey, uh, here's a dog uh, for you. It's like, no, that, that's not how it works, man. Um, I build the bond. You can't just bring me a dog that I, I, that you chose for me and say, this is for me. But here's the, the, the in-between was interesting before uh, months before my dog passed. Um, there was a, a litter of kittens that were born in the, in the rose uh, bushes. And I'm shocked that uh, two of them decided to stay behind and they, they bonded with my dog. So now that my dog's gone, I'm not a cat lover at all. Uh, if anybody knows me, I, I, I hate cats. If anything, they're the ones that, that it's like, there was a, a joke that I saw yesterday, reminded me of it, uh, two, uh, two dogs and a cat, they go uh, before the Lord and, and got a, a they go over each dog. I think one was a Labrador and the other one was a, um, a German Shepherd. And they started going to every personality trait that these dogs have. And God said, okay, you sit to my left, you sit to my right. And then the cat, what are you, uh, what are you here for? And the cat's like, I believe you're in my seat, says the cat. I'm like, that's, that's the thing. <laughs> that's what cats do. It's like, what do you do all day? <laughs> so it's like, I'm only here when I want something. So that's been my, my thing against cats. But this cat, every time I see him, because he comes, he finds me. He looks for me. He feeds an outdoor cat. Uh, and it's been a, uh, just over two years now. I'm like, why, when I see you, do I just think about my dogs? It's the only cat that's uh, that calls to me, knows where I am, follows me wherever, knows what time I come home from work. He's, he's there. He's like, hey, you're home. I need to be fed too. But hey, you're home from work. Um, so it, it, it's something that, that bond with animals, as you mentioned, is, is important uh, and key. Something that my dad talked to me about when he was growing up in El Salvador. Um, he and his dog, uh, five, six, uh, seven years old, just sitting out there in the cornfields, looking over the stuff, you know, just, just him and his dog looking up at the stars and, and all that. So yeah, it, it is amazing. And, uh, thank you uh, so much for your time. So I'm going to leave it for one la last question here because, uh, for those for those that uh, are interested, you can go to www.shadowwarriorsproject.org to learn more um, and how you know, they can help um, with the effort to, uh, like as, as your organization does, help those that uh, suffer in silence. Um, this is more of an all-encompassing thing where the, the, the polarized world that we live in today uh, it, it, and hearing a story like yours where... <laughs> actual violence versus words are violence um how and the trauma that you've also sustained with with all this that's happened and how often if, if this is brought up it's become a like let's talk about the politics of it and like oh, again and how do you shut out all that noise how do you just put it all like i gotta do what i gotta do how, how do you how do you do that? Is there any advice that you can give to those that uh, in their own field of work or or lives that there's a lot of noise constantly, and they just gotta like set their mind to focus on what they gotta do? You know, the first thing I do is um, I stay away from social media relatively, uh, or I, I shouldn't say I stay away from it. I limit my exposure to it, mm. um, and I and same with the news is uh, you know it's we look to the news. I like watching local news and stuff that's yeah. very pertinent to, um, you know, our immediate lives. And, and I think the other outlook I have is uh, I look to both from politics as well as I don't look to Washington DC to solve my problems. Mm. Yeah. Um, I can't, ex I can't figure out what problems they've really solved ever. And that's not the left or the right. That's just, anything within the beltway um how often have they solved the problem and if they have it's 
I mean, it's not it's not many times, and most of the times they make problems bigger. And their whole idea, I think, is um, is to keep us separated. They want me and you to disagree because of our ethnicity or our uh, um, our sexuality or, or our you know our gender or whatever. Instead of you know, because no matter what our differences are, we have far more similarities. Um, to each other as a human race than anything. And if we would focus as much time on those similarities as we do getting distracted with the differences. Um, and I think that's the, that's the work of the devil anyways. It's uh it's fear and hate. And he wants me and you to fear and hate each other. Um, because if we do, then he can exercise his authority over us where uh, if we love one another for being people, for being mankind, no matter what the differences are. Um, and again, I go back to, I can, I can disagree with somebody and still love them. I can love them as a human being and forgive them for whatever. And I hope people are able to do the same with me because by far do I walk. I mean, I've made mistakes all the time in my life. Um, but uh, it's, uh, it's just, it's care. It's giving a crap about each other yeah, and, and not let that outside noise and if we focus on that love for one another instead of all that white noise or whatever you want to mm. call it that's that's trying to get us to hate and fear each other, um, life is so much easier. Life is so much easier and so much better. Yeah, definitely. And it's on that note that I that we'll leave it here with with the interview. Uh, Mark Osgeist, uh, I still can't believe I'm, I'm actually speaking with you. Uh, it's, uh, it's an honor and a, and a pleasure to have had you here on the Andres Agovia show. Thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. You have a wonderful day. It was great talking. Yeah, likewise, sir. And God bless you, your, your wife and your entire organization. Um, and well, yeah, uh, I help what I can, when I can, and I'm going to keep doing so. Well, thank you th again. Thank you so much for your support and all your listeners. God bless y'all. Um, you know, find a cause, get behind it, and be a part of something bigger than yourself. Amen whether that's us that. or somebody else. Amen to that. If you'd like to learn more how you can help, please go to www.shadowwarriorsproject.org. And by all means, share this episode with everybody that you know so they too can get learned on this and hopefully be moved to also help those that have done so much for us. Thank you, and I'll see you in the next one.